BGMC. The biblical truth lives here. scriptures foretold of the anointed one, Yeshua HaMashiach. The Messiah Yeshua came to call the people back to the truth of His word and to follow that righteous path. Yeshua then called Jewish men to be His disciples, and after His death and resurrection, those Jewish men told the world about the Jewish Messiah. Now, after 2,000 years, Beth Goyim Messianic Congregation has that same calling of those Jewish men telling all people, both Jew and Gentile, about the proper ancient path, teaching the Route 66 King's Highway from Genesis through to Revelation, and how you need and can get back to the proper roots of the faith and a closer walk with God. Now, let's hear the message. So if you guys will remember from a few weeks ago, we had, we had all determined and come to an understanding to really be adulterous, to really give Elohim your full opposition. You had, to, you had to have a relationship with him. You had to at least know who he was. And so we studied about a lot of folks in the Bible who actually spoke to the Father and even to the Son and to the Spirit, and opposed them anyway, and did some pretty drastic things in opposition. So I've got a question for everyone to start this off today. Does anybody think that there are people alive in the world today that have been spoken to by Elohim a group of people that have been spoken to by Elohim more than others that, uh, that have that same ability to oppose him. Uh, like Avraham. Can it, is there anybody in the world today like Avraham or like Bilam or, uh, or like Lot who can oppose Elohim like that? Is there is there a kifa is there a kifa in the world who can uh, straight up oppose Elohim the way the way kifa did? Anybody? Okay, let me let me broaden the question a little bit. So we know there is a a large church. We're here in the United States. And now we're, we're parked down here in the south, and this is the church capital of the world. There is a church every block, basically. Here, here in the south, there are about as many churches as there are houses. I think, uh, I think out on the road where I live, there are actually more churches than houses. So with all that religion... Do you think those church people can oppose Elohim the way Abraham did? Do they, do they have that same kind of relationship with him? They have a close enough relationship with him to oppose him like that? Anybody? Anybody? I'm hearing only crickets here. I think absolutely not. I don't. I don't think there is any anyone, um, even even in this Bible Belt, where they profess to be uh, so religious. I I think it's a rare thing. I don't think there there is, not anybody that I have met or known as a Christian, that um, that knows the Father that way. Um, so I, I'm, I, I'm thinking probably not until the false prophet uh, comes and the Antichrist. All right, well, I'm glad you've engaged this, Miss Vivian. 
how about how about the people who have come to knowledge of Shabbat? Do you think those people are closer? How about the people who do Shabbat and also believe in Yeshua? Do you think those people are a little bit closer? They've been spoken to a little bit more by by the Father than, say, the church. Absolutely. Absolutely have. And that's Uh, right. And that's exactly what I was getting at with this. So go ahead. Well, just from my personal experience, uh, when I was a Christian, I took many, many Bible courses. I took seminary-level courses. Uh, and I and I and I loved taking Bible courses, but I'll tell you, un- until I, I started keeping Shabbat and uh, the Torah, I didn't even scratch the surface, because everything in the New New Testament that is taught by the Christians is out of context. They have no context to it. So they don't actually understand what things mean. And it really takes, knowing the Old Testament, it takes a Jewish perspective to really understand what was going on. That's my two cents. All right. Well, that's, that's fabulous. And that's exactly, exactly what I was wanting somebody to say. So, so here we have somebody who's who's witness to the fact that you're not going to come to the Shabbat and, and a knowledge of Yeshua. See, lots of Jews have knowledge of Shabbat, but they don't know Yeshua. If you have knowledge of both of those in your heart, if both of those have been revealed to you, then you have, in fact, been spoken to by the creator of this universe, because nobody can reveal that knowledge except him. Kepha was a man who kept Shabbat, right? Yeshua said, who, are you, who am I? And he said, you're the son of God, you're the Mashiach. Yeshua said, you're blessed because no man has revealed this to you. So, if you're a Shabbat keeper that knows Yeshua... Humans have not revealed that to you. I mean, you might have heard it at some time in your life, but it didn't make you leave the church. You just heard it. Not until the Lord himself drew you away and drew you to the Shabbat. So this is what I'm getting at. So, since we're all Shabbat keepers here, oh yeah, okay. Go ahead, Javier. Hello, bro. Will, um, uh, it's it's uh, it's more than a hundred percent what you just say and what the sister said. Um, and uh, you know, coming from, especially me coming from uh, from a Catholic background, uh, now I understand, and I still have to learn more because you know, it's the world of God is not ending. You know, and there's no end to you know to learn of his word, there's no ending. I mean, his word is infinite. There is so much the, to learn from him, from the Lord. So, but the, the only way, if you if you think about it, uh, Brad Will, if you read all the accounts of Yeshua Messiah, there's nothing, nothing in the three books of his account, in the book of Matthew, Luke, and Mark, that he is, he is, he is the, he fulfilled the Torah. There's no one single verse, um, you know, that tells you that he's contradicting the Torah. There's none, zero, 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 zero. And the only way, the only way to understand him is if you know Torah, because the, the, the problem with the, with our, with the Christian community is that they 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 don't and that's the reason they don't understand him because he is a Torah keeper he, he there's no sin in him 
So all the new Rihadasha is about the Torah, everything, every single thing, except for the letters of Shaul that we know it's a little confusing, like, you know, Rab, Rab Joshua and, and Rab Andrew, you know, they were discussing about it, that those letters were, were to, to the leaders. So there's a different understanding for that. But, but Shaul never contradicted the Torah either as well, because he went to do his offerings. He went to do to Jerusalem to do his offerings. So the only way that you will understand Yeshua the Messiah is to to know the Torah because that's the, he's the Torah keeper. He is he is the Torah. So that's the only way. I mean that's 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 a different type of thinking. When you realize that you know that when you realize that hey you have to go back to the beginning. <laughs> you have to go, to go back to the to the Father to His foundation to His word. Then you will, then only then the Father will like you say just said a minute ago. He will reveal to you the truth. Awesome. I saw Rosa's hand up. <laughs> no, no, it's the glory is for the Lord, not for me. But, uh, you know, I still have to learn more. And we still have to be humbly learn more. But the glory is for the Lord and for our Father who, who teach us every Shabbat and through the leaders of our congregation. And then we have to keep moving. Thank you. That's so, great, and that sets that sets the next thing up really well. Now I saw Rosa's hand up. So what'd you have? Yeah, well, what I was going to say is that definitely when you have, you know, the the Father chooses us, and and and, and I believe that is so true because in my case, when I came. To Beth Kohen, um, I had never opened the Bible, and all I did was pray, and that was the relationship I had first. And then, you know, God put it in my heart to cover my hair, and He told me it was clearly He told me to cover my hair for one year, and then after that year, He was gonna let me know if I'm gonna I'm gonna keep covering my hair so you know is is something that is so i mean i i say i feel so blessed and i know that all the people that are here should say the same thing because it's a big blessing you know in my case i came from you know a very pagan family and you know my father's side was just christian you know, that had no idea of the Torah. We, I never got taught nothing from the Bible, basically. You know, so God gave me all these things before I came to Beth Goheen. And the first thing was to cover my hair. He put me on, on a test of a year. And I, I didn't know nothing about that there was a Messianic church. I didn't know that the, even Messianic you know, was, was, was a religion. I didn't know nothing about it. I didn't know a lot of things about, you know, that I know when I, well, before I came to, to, to Beth Kohim because God used to wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And he would tell me to look this up, to look this other thing up. And then to look the first thing that I, that I covered my head, he said, to look at the commandments. And I looked at them. And that I had to keep Shabbat. And he gave me, and I was working in a place, and he gave me exactly seven weeks so that I could say that I was not, and those seven weeks, I, had to, I told my boss that after that day that he gave me, which I remember was on November 2nd, he said that in that day, and that was the last time that I was not going to work no more Shabbat. And I, I, I told him, and then when I went back and I counted the weeks, it was seven weeks. And then after that, you know, when God promised you that you could do what he said, you're going to do what he said. Because then after that, they called me from a job in the hospital. And I went. And there you had to work one week and yes and one week and no. And I said, well, you know, I know the first three months, you know, I, I have to start. And then I'm going to tell the, my boss. That, you know, to get, I'm just going to work Sundays and not on, on, on Saturdays. Well, guess what? God only He made them find me for no reason. No reason at all. 
And then after that, I noticed that this was God's plan. And, and I was fired because that was his will. And since then, I said five years without a job. And I, I had to pray because I didn't listen to what he said the first time. So when I came to Let's go in. I was praying in my hand. I had already taken off my jewelry. I had taken off all that. God had taken all this stuff from me already. All the vanity I had in me. And God did this, you know, because I, I didn't have nobody to, to talk to me, to tell me, you know, this is the right way or this is the wrong way. I had nobody. And I had not even opened the Bible. God would just wake me up and he would put words in my mouth. And I would wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and just look and Start saying, what does this mean, blah, 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 blah. And that's how I found Yeshua, his name. I found Shabbat. I found that I, you know, I had a, the, the covering on my hair. He just put it to me. And then after that year, when I uncovered my hair, I knew that God was right. Because, you know, he said that all my mouth was when I had my hair uncovered. And as soon as I uncovered my hair, men started looking at me. With other eyes. And I said, no, I'm not, I don't want this. And that's when I covered my hair again. And since then, of course, I have my hair covered. But what I'm saying is, when you, when I, I went through Christianity before, and I used to go to Christian church, and you don't feel, you never, I never went through this experience before in my life. I was as lost as whatever. Because there is like a lot of things are okay. Which in the, when you come in the real truth, it's not okay. And then you like re you repent so much because you say you know if I would have only known, but God is so merciful, and He had the patience to change us little by little, and it, we have that relationship with. And I know that each one, which each one of us does, and that's why I said that this is so the best thing that has happened to me in all my life. Because, you know, this is a big blessing. Not everybody has this blessing. So many people are so blind right now. And, you know, it's very sad. And I, I, that's why I think that, you know, we have it so much that we have that zeal inside of us so much that, that we're, you know, in a heart. To, we don't want to change for nobody. You know, we want to be as best as we can be for God. So there is a big difference, you know, in not having Shabbat and not having Messiah in your life completely. These, these are great. These are great testimonies. There's no way I could have poured out uh, testimonies for the Lord leading you to Shabbat that were any better than that. That's for sure. So, so everybody listening and everybody watching this later, you have witness, you have witnesses that the Lord alone leads people to the knowledge of the Shabbat and to Yeshua. And I'm going to tell you, I agree with that. That's how it was done for me. Uh, no, one, no one really evangelized me. The Lord did as he said in Deuteronomy. He came and he got me himself. So... What would you guys all say if I told you that out of there's there's a growing messianic movement in this country. There's a growing movement of people leaving Sunday and switching to Saturday. And this is what we want to talk about. We all agree that the people who are closest to Elohim today are the people who gather and meet on Saturday and the people who do some form of the holy days. Those are the closest people on earth today to Elohim. So this is the part of the, the, the study where I'm going to make everybody mad. You guys ready for that? <laughs> okay, so I was part, when I left the church and came to the Shabbat, I was part of a Messianic congregation that was well-connected in Messianic circles. They were well-connected in the IAMCS and the MJAA. And what's that other goofy one? UA, UM, UMJC. 
UMJC, Rabbi Andrew knows that one. I never had much dealings with them, but they were well-connected in that. We got their newsletters. Okay, that those congregations really, the IMCS and the MJAA particularly, are, are very, very intertwined with the Assemblies of God Christian Church. And what those congregations do is they follow the printed Jewish calendar, most of them, and they follow uh, many traditional Jewish holy days, and they, they try to be very, very Jewish, and they put a Yeshua cherry on top. We believe in Messiah. I was a leader in one of those congregations for three years before I came here. And so, let's study some of the practices. We'll call that, I have a name for it, I call it mainstream Messianic Judaism. They mostly have big, nice congregational buildings. They'll have a big, nice ark. They have an aron. Now, anybody that's ever been to one of those, you'll hear that the ark means the aron hakodesh. You've heard that, Yahushua? Yahushua was over there laughing. He's heard it. I see Rabbi Andrew's head wrinkling up back there. He's heard that. He's laughing. The Aran HaKodesh, the Ark. And there's a beautiful Torah in there. And they do some blessings and prayers, and they open that thing up and turn the light on, you know. And it's all dressed out, and they'll even get it out and dance around with it, which incidentally, that ancient Torah scroll that they're dancing around with what they're doing is they're, they're actually rendering that thing where if you roll it out, you can't even read it. It destroys the writing inside of it to handle it that much. And you have people that are not qualified and not used to handling the Torah dancing around the room with it on their shoulder. So if they rolled that thing out, if it's an old one, like a kosher old one on lambskin or something, uh, if they rolled that thing out, you wouldn't be able to read a lot of it where you've rubbed it together like that. So, but anyway, they do stuff like that, and they have, and they're fun congregations. We enjoyed our time there mostly. They're very connected, as you say. They have lots of artists come in and sing and do concerts and things like that. And it's it. We really enjoyed our time, and we did learn the importance of Shabbat there. But that's as far as it went. They followed the printed Jewish calendar, and they used the Jewish names for those months. So let's tear that apart. So I'm going to tell you, and that is, by the way, the mainline Messianic movement is about 80%. If you look it up, you'll find that 80% of the people who believe in Yeshua and keep the Shabbat go to one of these types of congregations. So, let me tell you what they're doing. Uh, they take the name of foreign gods on their lips because they have a little calendar that they get in the mail, and man, those calendars have beautiful pictures of the wailing wall and all of this stuff. But we're going to read some scripture here. Uh, let's go to Shemot 20 and 3, and everybody knows this. Uh, you are to have no other gods before me. You're not to make for yourselves a carved image of any kind or representation of anything on heaven above or earth beneath or water below the shoreline. So no other gods. Now, let's skip a little bit. Let's go to Shemot 23, 13. Let's up the ante a little bit. 23.13, he says, Pay attention to everything I've said to you, and do not invoke the names of other gods, or even let them be heard crossing your lips. Okay. You want to hear it again? Uh, Yahushua 23.7. Yahushua 23.7. In keeping with my tradition here and my teaching style, this, it is scripture heavy. I, I try to back everything up with, with many scriptures from many different areas of scripture. 
in case there are any Christians listening, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to get out of the first five books of the Bible, or, you know, they may not believe it. They may say, oh, we're not under the law. Well, Yehoshua didn't write the law, so let's listen to what Yehoshua says. Twenty-three seven. Then you won't become like those nations remaining among you. Don't even mention the name of their gods, let alone have people swear by them. Oh man. Don't even mention it. And if anybody else is interested, there's another scriptural reference that comes to mind right off the top of my head, and that's uh Telahim eighty one nine. says the same thing. Incidentally, uh, if you back up to 81.3 in the CJB, that tells, you, that's, uh, that tells you how the Book of Enoch calendar cannot line up with Scripture. No way possible. But anyway, we're going to do 81.9. <clears throat> well, we'll start here. Uh, Hear, my people, while I give you a warning, Israel, if you would only listen to me, there is not to be with you any foreign god. You are not to worship an alien god. Now, some people will say, well, we're not worshiping them. But hey, in two places it says don't say their names. Because if you say their names and you put their name on your calendar as a heading, and you name one of your months after them, I've got some news for you. You are worshiping them. That's right. See, and, and again, I'm going to tell you something. Me and Rabbi Andrew did not compare notes at all. I had no idea what he was going to teach today, and vice versa. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to snag a little bit of his, his message today. Every word you say, every vow you say, every careless word that comes out of your mouth. So, you're going to let the careless word, oh, it's the month of Elul. Oh, it's the month of, it's the month of Nisan. It's the month of, uh, uh, oh, Tammuz, Tammuz, or Sivan. Those are the names of the months on the printed Jewish calendar. So those are all names of alien gods that they learned in Babylon. So that's why you'll never hear Rabbi Andrew say that when he's preaching a sermon. He will say, this is the beginning of the fourth month. Because in Scripture, there are month names mentioned. He calls it Aviv, Ziv, Bul. But if you look those names up, those are the only numbers Bull is eight, Ziv is two, Aviv means one or the first. So those are not names of demons. But the names on the printed Jewish calendar that you get in the mail are names of demons. So, sounds like a lot of Shabbat keepers that believe in Yeshua might be being a little unfaithful to Elohim, don't it? <laughs> all right so also in these mainline congregations they do a lot of holy days that are not part of scripture uh, I've, I've seen I well and at first I went to Rosh Hashanah apples and honey man Rosh Hashanah hey we did Shavuot tomorrow, the old congregation I used to serve as a leader at down in Concord. Shavuot tomorrow, they're gathering outside on the lawn for a picnic to have. They're going to wave their bread? No, they're not. They're going to eat cheesecake and ice cream. And they're not going to mention that bread. And if that bread gets mentioned, the leader over there is going to say, Oh, we can't do that. Who could bake a loaf of bread with a gallon of flour? You can't do that. That's only for Jerusalem. 
And so to that I say, if it's only for Jerusalem, why are you gathering on Shavuot at all? <laughs> so, so they violate the rules on uh, foreign gods and foreign holy days quite a bit. But uh, they also violate the holy days. Listen, we cooked out on every single holy day at that congregation. I went to, I went to the MJAA large meeting, and we purchased food in the restaurant on Shabbat. We did all of that stuff. There was purchasing on Shabbat. The, the stores were not closed. There was cooking on every Shabbat. When I was at Beit Shofarot, that was the name. There was cooking on every Shabbat. And if there wasn't enough food, you know, the leader would say, hey, take off your kippah so nobody knows you're Jewish and go over to Food Line and get some stuff. So that's, that's, how, that's how the traditional mainline Messianic congregations roll, uh, the ones that I've dealt with. And I was part of that organization for quite a long time. <clears throat> so, but there's also, there's also another type. Well, also, let's, let's hit the last thing on these MJAA congregations and these other congregations. A lot of them will ordain women. I have seen females standing, standing in the pulpit. As a matter of fact, my wife served as cantor at one of these. So my wife stood in front of that magnificent ark as it was opened and sung all those blessings. She's not a son of Aaron, that's for sure. So, but we didn't know any better. We were taught lies. And imagine our surprise after being taught lies in the Christian church and then in turn getting a degree and teaching those lies myself. Imagine my surprise after a few years in the Messianic movement being taught additional lies and teaching those lies myself. I was... Uh, so, I, so guys, I actually came to this the hard way. I got drugged through and across every bit of stupidity in the whole American religious movement. So when I hear those lies now, when I hear that garbage now, I can, I can feel it. I can smell it. So that's why, that's why I'm going here. And this stuff's not easy to move here. And this stuff's going to get harder. I've got a lot of friends that are in those movements. And, and to those people watching, what I want to say is I'm not singling any person out. I'm talking about these religious movements as a whole. Just my experience and what I've heard and seen and witnessed in these congregations and movements. So I'm not pointing at any one specific person and trying to punch them. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, another thing you'll hear in those traditional ones, they'll do the G-D. They'll do the L-R-D. -D. They'll say, Adonai, Adonai, if you read the complete Jewish Bible, as you know, the word for Jehovah's proper name is Adonai. Okay, well, that's a lie, okay? His name isn't Adonai. Adonai is a title, Lord. But if it says his proper name, why would you substitute Lord? His name's not Lord, but they do it. And then they won't even say Lord. They say L-R-D. <laughs> like you ever see the Hebrew hammer? He made fun of that. The woman said, hey, my Miriam's all grown up, you know? She's available. And the guy looked up, and it was this ugly girl with braces on her teeth and pimples on her face. And the guy said, 
Oh, no, oh, no. G-D is the only one for me. <laughs> so, but anyway, so they say, Adonai, 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 Adonai. So that's a lie. They're, they're fearful. How are you going to know somebody? Do you think Elohim wants you to know him personally? How much, how much, does, how much does Scripture talk about a personal relationship? Abraham knew him. Yeshua wanted you to be his friend. Uh, can, you be, can you be Jehovah's friend if you're calling him Adonai? Or G-D? Uh, you're, it's such a distance from him. He wants you to know his name. Now, he doesn't want you to use his name inappropriately. And he certainly doesn't want you to use his name as vanity. But he wants you to use his name, and he wants you to use it in the appropriate context. So anybody, so before I get off of, off of mainline messianic Judaism, does anybody have anything to say or add or ask? I'd like to say something. So oh. Down here in Florida, so the two the two messianic uh, congregations have been to. So one of them is um, is pulling an all nighter. Uh, so you're supposed to bring your sleeping bag or whatever, and um, you're going to uh, just pray and worship all night until breakfast. The the other one is having an evening, um, an a, 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 an evening service, and uh, I understand they will be serving ice cream. That's it. All right. Well, what's the other one having for breakfast? Bacon and eggs. They firing up the gas grill. No, 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 they, no. They they do not go that far. <laughs> No, no. Well, I mean, the the next day, the the a holy day is over, so I imagine they will cook a breakfast. But they they do not they do not cook on Shabbat. Um, you bring, and they they usually have some cold foods there, uh, you know, a potluck kind of thing, and uh, and they make it clear in the literature that you not bring pork or shellfish um so if you don't know they they kind of clarify that but i mean that that's about it you know all right well that's cool that's cool now what about you rosa i saw a hand there i wanted to ask you about those uh Messianic that you said that they put those things to the month, you know, and, and these are like other gods. Like, do you know, like, where did they get this information or don't they know that they, these are other gods or who invented that stuff? That's, that's like, like God. So, like, I mean, I was just curious, like, would you know that info? Yeah, a lot of people actually know that those are the names of other gods, but they just simply don't think that it matters. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. You're asking where they got it from? Uh, that came yeah. from the Babylonian Talmud. They learned, they learned that calendar. You see the Jews say it's the new year when it's the seventh month. And they say, well, that's the head of the religious year. Well, that's complete Babylonian garbage. That was, that was the head of Nebuchadnezzar's religious year. It makes no sense for it to be the head of Jehovah's religious year because the first day of the seventh month is the shout when he returns, and then ten days later he starts reading the books and judging well, that makes no sense for that to be the beginning of Jehovah's religious year. The beginning of Jehovah's religious year is before Pesach, the preparation, and then at the beginning of his time, 
you're redeemed, and then you learn of him, you purge, and you start to produce, and then you produce a great harvest, which is tomorrow. And then, in the seventh month, the shout and accounts are settled. It makes no sense whatsoever for the seventh month to be the head of our king's religious year because he would be surprising and judging people who were not yet redeemed. So everyone would burn in hell. Who can be saved if they're not redeemed first? Thank you, Martin. So now, let's move on. And I have a lot of friends in this movement. I have a lot more acquaintances in this movement. And this movement's not nearly as big. And again, I'm not punching any one specific person or group because these are the small group assemblies. A lot of them meet in houses or they rent little buildings somewhere and they meet. And their belief system is completely all over the map. Oh, okay. Rav Yahashua wants to say something. Shalom, shalom again. Uh, Rav Will, this, um, the part of the names of the, in the calendar, it's, it's, it's a kind of tricky, um, also for, um, well, I imagine more for Latin people than, than English speakers, because also the trying to eliminate these things from our world is like um, complicated. Um, and I say especially because also the the days of the week in in, in Hebrew um, in Hebrew is good. Um, still have for the first day till the sixth day, and then Shabbat. So when you say it in Hebrew is it's all uh, Yom Rishon is like the first day, yeah, and like that till Yom Shishi and then Shabbat. But then, um, the the names of the month is like the is when when the the com complication with names of of other deities and stuff. Then in Spanish, the name the name of the days of the week are pretty much like that, um, you know. And I imagine in English as well when you say Sunday is the day of the sun and yeah you know and 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 Spanish is 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 it's also complicated because you say for example the 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 third day uh, is supposed to be Martes so we say Mars so it's it's and Jupiter and stuff like that like Jueves and so so it's it's the it's this Babylonian um, tradition and, and that, that the, the Romans or the Greek um, get it from the Babylonian and then the Romans get it from the Greeks and and all this that it, it was well we call it uh, myth or mythological names um, that, that the reality is their religion and then they took it then the, the it's, it looks like it affect the whole world you know it's not it's not uh, um, and and of course we're supposed to be the people of God, and then we're supposed to follow God's example. He says the first month, the second month, and like the same the same example that he did with the days, first day, third day, sixth day, and then Shabbat. You know, following that example, we are unfortunately the enemy is like in, injecting and putting things that it doesn't look bad. But then the Lord already says, "Don't don't put names of God. Hmm? Don't don't let it cross your lips. You know those names of those. You know He's jealous. So it's hard. It's hard now nowadays to, you know, oh, what day is today? Or oh, today is, you know, Sunday? Or, you know, and I'm saying I'm trying to, um, um, also with the month of, and and I I guess, um, July." You know, it's this 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 guy Julius from, Caesar. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that it confused everybody, you know. Um, but um it's it's part of the of, of the fight, I guess we um how to resolve that problem in, in Judaism is of course it's following Torah. Um but also in our life we think that 
uh, um, how how we going to communicate with others? Like, oh no, today is um, the first day of the week. Today is the third day of the week. I guess I guess trying to get that um, in our minds. Maybe in the community it's not easy, but maybe in yeah in general world it's complicated. I I I think what it is is when you're calling it God, you know they're putting out a calendar with these names on it, so people are thinking that those names are correct. There's one thing about dealing with secular, but it's when you make it something that's supposed to be of God, that's where it crosses the line, I believe. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what we're going to get into, and that's what I'm getting at with all of this messianic stuff today. The church looks at us like we are the Jedi Knights, like we are closer, like we are closer to the power than they are. Except, except we're not. A lot of us are not. So I'm going to get on these small group studies. And I have a name for them that when I'm speaking in private circles is probably not so nice. I, I have referred to some of them as the toxic small group. Uh, for one, I have never been to one of these small group Shabbat studies that's in a home or in a, in a small group setting somewhere. I've never been to one that didn't have a row of crockpots on cooking food and a row of coffee makers cooking the coffee. I've never been to one. Every single one of them that I've ever visited or been to is doing that. So they're actually cooking on the Shabbat. Now, they, they do a pretzel twist and say... Well, we cooked it the day before. We're just keeping it warm today. But, uh, but they don't even try that with the coffee. They just make the coffee on Shabbat and say that's not cooking. So, uh, but, but I can't even, I don't even have time to go into the varying uh, belief systems of all of the small groups and, and small Shabbat keepers that I've, that I've mentioned, uh, they're all over the map. Some of them I call Enochers because they, they follow the book of Enoch more than the Torah. Uh, they certainly set their holy days by the book of Enoch and the calendar in that, uh, Others don't use that. They shun the book of Enoch, and they shun many of the other writings, and they don't believe in the Talmud, but they also shun parts of the Torah as well. So uh, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of different belief systems in that, in that system, uh, but the one common thread that I've seen that they've got in common is they're all pretty much cooking at their assemblies on Shabbat. Uh, and they all, most of them, and not every one of them, but most of the small group studies are actually calling on a demon's name for God. Instead of calling on his actual name or anything close, they say Yahweh. You, ever, you guys ever hear anybody say Yahweh? You ever hear a Sabbath keeper that believes in Yeshua say Yahweh? Okay, well, well, Yahweh is the name of Zeus, Jupiter, the, the chief demon god of the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, if you look that up, it looks in English, I don't know about you Spanish speakers, I don't know how that alphabet works enough to discuss this at length, but in English it looks like J-O-V-E, which to English speaker eyes, you see, I'm primarily, I've learned to speak English all my life. It, uh, to me, it looks like Jove. But to Latins and Greeks, it didn't look like, it didn't, it's not what you would say, Jove. You would say Yahweh for that. So, uh, better than half of these small group people are, take, are invoking the name Yahweh. So, uh, and they will not, and most of them are not about to stop when you tell them either. 
So anyway, so you get called away, and most people, even most of the people in these small group studies and in the mainline Messianic movement have told me what you guys told me. The Lord wouldn't leave me alone. It kept coming to me. It came to me in the night. It wouldn't leave me alone. I knew that I needed to start keeping Saturday as the Shabbat. I knew there was more. So these people are actually being called out by, by the one true God. Now, I don't know the path you have to take to end up calling on Yahweh once the one true God has called you out uh, and called you to himself. But now I'm going to tell you the most, the most disturbing thing about the small groups. I've talked to a lot of the leadership in these groups, uh, mostly here in central North Carolina, but some in Virginia and some in South Carolina. I've talked to a lot of the leaders, well, and some in western North Carolina. But I've talked to a lot of the leadership in these groups. And if I talk to them for a while and discuss the shortcomings of, say, their calendar or some of their other beliefs as it, as it relates to the Torah and as it relates to the Brit Hadashah, at least half of the leadership of these groups have told me, well, the scriptures themselves were corrupted by the Masoretic writers of the text of the Bible. So, I mean, half of the leadership I've talked to does not believe that the Torah and the Brit Hadashah is the actual, only, true, written, written word of God. And, I mean, I've heard some very far out there stories. Uh, I've heard some of their leadership say that there was a ninth person on Noah's Ark, and he hid on Noah's Ark with the book of Enoch and the book of Jubilees, and that's why we have it. So, anyway, what I'm trying to point out is uh, that you're at a very unique place uh, at, here at Beth Goyim. Uh, very, very, very few places, even places that keep the Shabbat, tear deeply into the Scripture and will discuss something provocative like the equidistant lettering systems and why the text of the Bible is the true Word of God in the text of the Bible. We're not afraid of those subjects. Uh, we're not afraid to take on and say all of these other books are just witchcraft. Uh, I think the Talmud of the Jews, and I know there are a couple of Jews that do watch my teaching. They don't yet believe in Messiah, and they get mad at me real often, but I'm going to tell you right now, the Talmud of the Jews is witchcraft. I mean, what do you, what do you, that doesn't sound nice, but what do you think Jehovah Elohim thinks of the book of Yuma? Or the book of the Zohar? Do you think it's, he thinks it's all right for the Jewish guys to be reading that stuff alongside his Torah? So we're down to about a minute. Does anybody have anything to say about this? No, oh, Rosa's got a little bit here. Go ahead, Rosa. I just want to say this is a very interesting thing topic because these are things that even to me right now are new what you're saying because i never heard of this stuff so it's very interesting and it's good that that we learn this stuff because we don't know what we might you know crash with so it's good that we learn this so we could be prepared for any of the spiritual war well, I believe that's why the Lord's called me to do it, because uh, I seem to be the one that's gotten in the in the place where 
I'm dealing with more and more of these folks. Uh, Sally, go ahead. Oh, okay. I saw the hand up. I'm going to jump in and say, just wow. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, what disturbed me was the leadership and the patent dishonesty of some of the leadership that I talked to of these small groups. First, many of them are unqualified. Most of them just preached at a church somewhere, and they realized it was wrong, and they just moved to the Shabbat, and they kept being the teacher. They didn't stop. They didn't, they didn't seek another teacher or anything. They just sought out YouTube or whatever. But, uh, but the, the thing that bothered me the most about all of this was the, the number of these people that are willing to say, well, the Bible we have is not all the way accurate. We need to go down to Ethiopia and read that Bible written in that language that those guys have to, to find out what's accurate. And the dishonesty, I've had some of those leaders actually tell me that they read the, the second and third books of Enoch, which most people reject. Even the people who read the first book of Enoch and think that it should be Scripture will reject the second and third books of Enoch because they start elaborating on what's written in the first one, and it gets real obvious that, you know, that stuff is contradicting the Torah and especially the Brit Hadashah. So I've had some of those leaders tell me, well, I do believe the second and third books of Enoch, but these newbies that are coming to the assembly aren't ready to hear it. And so that, that is the kind of stuff that disturbs me about the, sh the modern Shabbat-keeping movement. I don't, I hear, and see, it's a problem because the folks who are in church uh, are lost. So they, they have really yet to be saved. But, you know, someone that's been spoken to by the Lord and, call, and called to the Shabbat, the punishments can be very, very grave for being in willful disobedience or even willfully deceiving your flock. So the reason I point this out is because these movements are growing and you're going to run into them. And I'm out of time for today, but I'm far from done with this series. Go ahead, Rosa, and then it's a five-minute break. Yeah, I just want to say something. Now that you're saying that, Russ, it's like there's also in the Christianity that is that problem that a lot of them, they hear about, you know, about the, the Sabbath, and they, they hear the truth, and, and they know about it. And, you know, they, 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 they verify that it is true, but they don't change it. A lot of people are going to walk out because people want to be in places where they want to hear what's comfortable for them. So a lot of there's a lot of pastors that have gotten the truth, but they just keep doing it just because they're going to lose, you know, people, and that means they're going to lose money. Unfortunately, it's so sad, but it's true, you know, and they don't want to change it. Just because of that. Man, so that's very sad. Amen. For, yeah, for the churches, a lot of it is all about the money. But anyway, I am out of time for this installment, but next week we'll be back with more. Shalom. This is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman. I would personally like to thank you for tuning in to The Remnant's Call each and every week. You can listen to the full message on our website, bethgoyim.org. If you have drawn closer to the King of Kings, learned more about Him today, we are blessed. If you are blessed by these messages, please consider a donation to our ministry. You can go to our website, bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M 
www.thepaypal.org and click on the donate button. You do not have to have a PayPal account to donate. All you need is a debit card. Once again, thank you very much for listening to The Remnants Call. If you have not taken your first steps to be born again, just ask God's help. Remember, it's His loving grace that has come to find you. No one is worthy or able to reach God, but God can reach us, and He's reaching out to you now. Just open your heart and let Him in. His arms are open, and the blessing of salvation and eternal life are waiting for you. Don't let it wait any longer. you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you and give you his shalom. Shalom. My name is Messianic Rabbi Andrew Dinnerman, and I invite you to come to visit our congregation. If you are in the tri-state area, come out and visit with us on Shabbat. We are a congregation of Jews and Gentiles living as one in the Messiah Yeshua. BGMC is a place of true worship. The focus never wanders from the Hebraic roots of our faith. Beth Goyim is rooted in the Word of God from Bereshit through to the book of Revelation. Messiah's strong words against man-made tradition are carefully recorded in Matthew 7. That is the reason we only follow the straight-up instructions found in Scripture. Truly, the way, the truth, and the life. If you're looking for a deeper walk with Adonai, come out for our Tuesday evening Bible study called Messianic Torah Time. Come, spend the day with us on any Shabbat. We start at 11 a.m. with the sound of the ancient Hebrew shofar. Next, we offer our King praise and worship in English, Hebrew, and Spanish. After worship, we review the headlines in the previous week's news from around the globe, especially News from the Holy Land, Israel. We don't just list the news headlines as current events, but we comb through the scriptures searching for clues to understand what they mean and then to help pinpoint prophetically our current position on Adonai's clock. After digesting all that modern information, we leave the world behind as we journey with our Adonai deep into his eternal word, not with just one or two scriptures, but usually seven or more scriptures. The spiritual nourishment and the richness of his kingdom become accessible to the ones who share this special time and seek them out. The day does not end there. Because Shabbat is so special to him, there is always so much more that our king desires to share. So instead of separating and leaving, we stay together as a family for potluck lunch and an afternoon study of our king's word. We close this Shabbat together with the reading of the New Week's parasha, That's the Torah portion. Even after those blessings, many of us just can't get enough. So the members bring prepared homemade foods to share while we all enjoy an uplifting movie together. If all that information is not quite enough, you can check out our website where you will find over 200 video teachings and Biblical Holy Day studies. Under Messianic Torah Time, the Hebrew Roots button, you'll discover free studies on many, many different topics, including PowerPoint slide presentations. If Beth Goyim sounds like a place you'd love to visit, but you live outside the tri-state area, there is still a way to connect with us. We stream live on the internet on Tuesday, Thursday, and Shabbat. The website is www.bethgoyim.org. That's B-E-T-H-G-O-Y-I-M.org. Our phone number is 973-338-7800 or 978-2-YESHUA. That's 978, the number 2, 
Yeshua. Shalom.